Welcome to the Sisterhood of Sweat. I am here today with Kirsty Ennis, U.S. Marine Corps Sergeant Kirsty Ennis lives in Roaring Fork Valley area in Colorado, where she is pursuing a master's in public administration to accompany her master's of business administration and her master's in psychology. Kirsty uh, Kirf, served as a door gunner and CH-53 helicopter mechanic in the U.S. Marine Corps when her aircraft crashed during combat operations in Afghanistan 2012, she was critically injured. In addition to the left leg amputation, she sustained full thickness facial trauma, spinal injuries, a traumatic brain injury, and shoulder injuries. After recovery, Kirsty became dedicated to exceeding expectations. She works as a stunt woman in major motion pictures, a veteran's advocate, and as an adaptive extreme athlete. In effort to repurpose herself to continue serving people as she did in the military, Kirsty established the Kirsty Ennis Foundation to provide education and opportunity in the outdoors and support other nonprofits dedicated to improving the quality of life of individuals and families. There's so much to say about Kirsty, but we have a short amount of time today. So I just want to dive into the interview, but you guys can catch her full bio on iTunes on the Sisterhood of Sweat. Without further ado, I want to welcome the one, the only, Kirsty Ennis to the Sisterhood of Sweat. Well, wow, thank you for having me. That was uh, that was quite the introduction. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are quite uh, the inspiration. Uh, I guess kill all excuses for all of us. Um, <laughs> and I'm just, I'm so inspired by how you went through something so challenging, so much adversity, 38 surgeries, and you have made your life into something beautiful. I don't even think of you as an amputee. I, I kind of want to dive into your story for people. Uh, if, if you could tell the story of how you crashed in the helicopter and kind of just go through how, why you were even there in the first place. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I, I always tell everybody that I was one of the lucky ones, that, that my heroes were my parents. Um, I, I was raised by two Marines, and of course, I looked up to them and admire, admired everything that they were doing, and I wanted to give them a reason to to be proud of me like I was proud of them. So at 17 years old, I decided that I was gonna take myself out of my junior year of college and join the Marine Corps. Uh, I got an age waiver, lied through my teeth to tell, um, or lied through my teeth to my dad saying that I would do a desk job to get him to sign the paperwork. And lo and behold, I ended up being a 50 caliber machine gunner on the helicopters and turning wrenches to maintain the helicopters. Um, I ended up doing two deployments to Afghanistan. The first one went uh, fairly smooth, all things considered, and um, the second one, not so much. Um, about five months into my second deployment, um, we were meant to be going outbound to do a combat resupply mission and in turn to extract some Marines that had gotten into a, a pretty bad situation. And unfortunately, we never made it to those Marines. Um, it was pretty late on the night of June 23rd, 2012. And the last things I remember was my tail gunner calling for power. And by that, it means to, to level off the nose of the aircraft because we were uh, pointing down into the ground. And next thing I know, the helicopter came nose up and rolled, rolled left. And with me being on the left side of the aircraft that night, I just stared at the ground um, until we hit it. And as a result of the helicopter crash, I sustained some, some pretty severe injuries. Um, you know, a left leg above the knee amputation, traumatic brain injury, damage to my arms, my ears, my eyes, my spinal cord. Um, and it's been a long road. People all too often think that uh, my recovery is over, but that's not it. It's, it's always a work in progress. So what was going through your mind uh, when you knew that the crash was imminent, that you were indeed going to be 
fully gun you're strapped to a gun and you're you're gonna crash you know i don't i honestly people ask me all the time you know what was going through my head and i honestly i just counted until we hit the ground and even after we hit the ground and even after my entire jaw was shattered and i could fit my fist through the lower right side of my face and you know the severe pain and everything that was going through my head i don't think i realized that i was going home um, for whatever reason, in my mind, even after I got hurt, you know, they were going to sew me up and I was going to go, you know, right back into the fight. I was going to stay uh, with my guys. And yeah, it didn't really hit me until they threw me onto another aircraft and brought me to the makeshift hospital in the, in the middle of Afghanistan. And my gunnery sergeant and my sergeant major walked in and they were both crying. And that's when I had the realization that like, I was actually hurt and um, that this was going to be the defining moment in my life, more or less. And um, I think the biggest part that I struggled with wasn't necessarily the, the physical injuries, but more so um, realizing that I was going to lose my purpose. You know, joining the Marine Corps at 17 years old, that's all I knew. And I loved it. Um, I, I had no intention on getting out of the military. So that was probably the toughest pill to swallow. Um, was was being stripped of was being stripped of my purpose, and then trying to come to terms with the injuries that I had, you know, physically, mentally, and emotionally. Did you feel like you were stripped, kind of like of who you are or who you were, like you know, at that time, like an athlete, a marine, a, your whole identity? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, like, I mean, that's who I was. Uh, you know, we say that I bled green. Um, you know, I. I was combat meritoriously promoted to sergeant and I wanted to ride that way for as long as possible. I was, I was intending to get back from that deployment, go to the drill field, um, you know, to make Marines. And then I had every intention on putting in my package to go the pilot route. Um, you know, I, I had, I had my future lined up and planned and mapped out and, and yeah, that, I mean, I do, I feel like it was stolen from me in some ways. Why do your friends and family call June 23rd your alive day? Um, so um, there's a number of reasons people call it the alive day, but my specific one is when my pilots called in the accident, everybody kind of assumed that the female gunner was dead on impact because I had this really severe head trauma um, and obviously came to pulled through and kept living. So it's, it's one of those moments where you, you come close to tasting death and uh, you come out on the other end and you're still alive. So oftentimes, instead of celebrating my birthday, I celebrate my alive day. And you kind of like, you're going through something really traumatic. So it's almost like you almost lost it completely. You almost lost your life and everything completely. So do you feel like you're able to live more fully than you did before? Well, I, I lost a lot. You know, if I looked at my life and at a young age, I'm only 27 now, if I looked at my life and what I have lost thus far, I, you know, I've lost my memory. I've lost years of my life to recovery into the hospital, I lost my leg. I lost my career, but instead I, I decided to look at what I've gained. Um, you know, it's been a blessing and a curse. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. Um, but it's been a blessing because look at my life now. I've gained some some pretty insane opportunities and experiences, but more importantly, I've had some pretty amazing people come into my life too. Um, and had I not had this happened, you know, the, I wouldn't even be sitting here talking to you, you know, realistically. Um, and so I, I just, a whole new life perspective. You know, I live my life totally differently than, than I did before. So, what have you found to be true about yourself through all of this, 38 surgeries later, um, Brazilian as hell, I, I got to say. What have, you, <laughs> what have you found to be true about you? Uh, you know, the biggest things is, like I said, it's just, it's just how I live my life. You know, I joined, the, I joined the Marine Corps to serve people, but I can honestly say that, you know, I've been through hell and high water and the darkest moments of my recovery, I realized that I was being selfish and I couldn't live for myself, that I didn't want to live for myself. Um, I was quick to throw in the towel on my first alive day, actually. And now I look at myself and the days that I do have, you know, a rough time or I'm in pain or I'm struggling, I look around me and, 
You know, I recognize the fact that I want to live for my family. I want to live for the people, the other people who are struggling or the men and the women that never came home. Um, so, I, you know, I learned a lot, a lot about myself in the sense of, of, of how significant, um, you know, the people, the friendships and the relationships, I guess, that you have in your life. Um, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be where I am without those people. I'd love to sit here and say that I'm strong and I did it by myself, but that's not the case. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I know, like, I mean, even with my hamstring, like, reattachment surgery, which I had, which is, like, the whole reason why I even knew who you were. My mother brought over this guidepost. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm, like, I was kind of, like, a little bit down, you guys, and I was on pain meds, and I went from running and competing a million miles an hour to a screeching halt. And, um... So I was like, well, what does my mom want me to get out of this? I'm looking at it, and the first thing I see is how a church and a mosque came together. And I'm like, oh, that's an interesting, like, okay, <laughs> how did that happen? And then I look, I'm like, oh, your story really caught my eye. And I dove into it, and I started reading it, and I was just so inspired, truly, and motivated that you know how we feel like, I don't know, sometimes that our life, it, our body is our life, like, if especially if you're physical. And it just made me realize that my life wasn't over just because I couldn't do all the things that I did in the past. I don't know what I'll be doing in the future, but just knowing that there was more to us than just our bodies. How did you pull that out of yourself to where it was more like, I think, I feel like it's like sheer will that you just made a decision. Yeah. Well, honestly, when I was in the hospital, my doctors thought that I could just take a happy little pill or, you know, all of my healing would take place inside four walls. And I recognized the fact that it wasn't working. Um, it wasn't working for me and it wasn't working for a lot of other people. Um, so I, I, I guess just being tired. I was exhausted um, trying all these different therapies and recoveries in the hospital. I, you know, I kind of just dumbed it down. Um, you know, I was like, all right, well, what's, what's right in front of us that can help me? And I just started going outside and spending a lot of time outside and then um, trying sports that I never even really knew existed. Um, you know, I'm originally from Florida, so don't know anything about snow <laughs> or the mountains, <laughs> but I took up snowboarding and um, Fortunately, I excelled in it um, pretty quickly, but trying something so far out of my wheelhouse and something totally new gave me that confidence that I could go out and do anything. So once I started dabbling with something that was, you know, ultimately foreign, a foreign sport to me, I, um, you know, I started looking, you know, like a bigger picture. I started looking to the mountains. I started mountaineering, started rock climbing, started ice climbing. So, you know, and people, you know, when people are having having a hard time with the recovery. That's what I always, I really encourage them, A, just spend as much time as possible outside, you know, get away, get away from the phone. You know, the phone's my nemesis. I, you know, I'm on it constantly, but, um, you know, I try to make time just, just to be outside and, um, and again, go out and try something new. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be a sport, but, but something that, you know, that's something that you would never imagine yourself doing anyways. Well, I love the fact that, you are here you are you're, you're you're all these you know all these things have happened to you you've had more surgeries than most of us will have in a lifetime i'm sure and you're you know you had your leg taken off and not just once but like then you had to have below the knee then above the knee which is much harder to deal with um and here you are, you're like climbing a mount summits. Like most of us don't even want, like a lot of us, I want to climb a mountain, but a lot of us out there do not want to climb a mountain or snowboard. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> We'd like to watch someone else do it. So I think it's pretty amazing that you turned your adversity into, you had this courage to go and do things that are still probably somewhat dangerous. Tell us about some of your, uh, your treks in the mountains and what that was like. Yeah, I, um, so I guess for the last couple of years, I decided that I was going to climb the um, tallest peak on each of the seven continents. And, you know, I never wanted it to be about like, look at what I can do on my one leg or, you know, me beating on my chest saying, you know, I'm cursed to hear me roar or anything. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I wanted there to be 
heart and meaning and passion behind it too. So I started dedicating um, nonprofits behind each climb. Um, it started with the highest point in Africa when the water boys actually reached out to me and said, hey, how do you feel about how, how do you feel about climbing Kilimanjaro with us and, uh, and fundraising for clean water for the East Tanzanians? And I fell in love with the idea. Um, and that's really just when hook, line, and sinker, I decided that I was going to keep going after the big mountains. Um, and so since then, uh, that was in March of 2017. Since then, I've climbed the highest point in Oceania uh, down in Indonesia called Kirstens. I uh, did that in conjunction with the Heroes Project, um, climbed the highest point in North America, have to go back to, to actually summit, um, uh, better known as Denali, in support of the nonprofit Building Homes for Heroes. And I actually just got back uh, from Russia, climbing the highest point in Europe in support of a nonprofit called Glam for Good. Um, wow. What was, what was that like? What was your experience like since it was so recent in your mind? Um, you know, it, it was actually a pretty brutal, uh, last summit day. You know, I, I'm addicted, honestly addicted is a word now. Uh, like I'm I addicted understand. To it. It's like an adrenaline junkie sort it, of, right? Well, I'm good at climbing mountains because I forget how bad it sucks. Like luckily I have really bad memory, <laughs> so I can just <laughs> go after it. Um, but it, it's miserable. And in the moment, um, you know, I'm my own worst enemy. I beat myself up. We, we tracked for 15 hours that day just to make it to the top and negative nine degree uh, temperatures, um, just a long day, bad weather rolled in, super high winds. And the whole time, you know, I, I'm really, really hard on myself. You know, I'm not moving fast enough. I'm not moving, you know, you know, efficiently or I'm in pain or, you know, all sorts of things go through my head or obviously the biggest one, like, what if I don't summit? Uh, you know, how are you going to bring that home? And the reality is, you know, when I get to the top, um, which I did summit over in Russia, I'm reminded of my resiliency. I'm reminded of my independence. You know, going up that mountain is, is so symbolic for me, um, simply because I fought so long to stay out of a wheelchair, you know, to live, uh, you know, an independent life as a woman, you know, you know, utilizing my prosthetic as a tool and not just letting it define me. And, um, it's a pretty emotional experience, really. I feel like, I think, I think we all have our own personal summits that we're chasing and, and uh, mine just happened to be on some of the highest points in the world. <laughs> <laughs> what type of workouts do you do to, uh, to do climbs like that and just to be snowboarding and what type of workout do you do? Do you do it in the gym? Do you do it outside? Well, a lot of it, um, you know, to be, to be efficient in the mountains and at altitude, you honestly just have to have time in the saddle. You have to spend a lot of time in the mountains and a, and a lot of time uh, breathing with pretty low oxygen. But I do a ton of um, like interval training to get the heart rate up and then to make it drop back down real quick again, then make it peak again. And um, I also do a, quite a bit of, of strength and conditioning. Uh, the biggest thing is I'm, I, I really try to focus on keeping what muscles I have left in my, uh, my residual limb on my left side. Um, keeping those strong in the gym, um, because obviously not having a quad or a hamstring, uh, it's, it's a huge, uh, it impacts everything quite a bit. So I really try to keep the left side strong, keep building up the left glute. Um, and, and my back, my back takes a beating. So I really put a focus on that. Yeah, you just basically work around it and just do what you can. Uh, I know a lot of people out there would be like, I mean, they have been with me as well, and I'm not even on the level of your injuries, um, where they say, are you going to jump in the splits again? Because, <laughs> like, the, you know, I was always jumping in the splits for a fitness competition, and it was a little, I was overtraining, and it was late at night. And so I was a little dehydrated, so I popped my whole, like, whole entire hamstring um so basically I, yeah i want to again i mean so where do you where do what do you you know do people say to you kirsty like you could get really hurt or you could you know are they like cautioning you yeah you know people warn me left and right you know my mom and my dad hate that i climb these mountains and half the time that i snowboard these big mountains and stuff um but you know it's you got to do what makes you happy you know, I, I've come so close to death, um, a couple times now that, you know, if I, I do run the risk of serious injury and death on these mountains, especially like when I go climb, you know, Everest in the spring, 
But the reality is, is if something's going to happen to me, I'm a firm believer in fate. And if I'm going to go out that way, I'm meant to go out that way. And you know what? I'm going to die living. Doing what I makes love me. that. I love that. <laughs> and that's exactly how I feel. It just lights me up inside to do challenging things. And I can't imagine a life without it. And so I, I, I see myself jumping in the splits again. <laughs> Good. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but uh, I was thinking, I, I was looking into this climb. Lewis Howes from the School of Greatness had mentioned on his podcast. Jesse Isler has this this climb. It's a it's kind of like a vert. It's a real climb, like doing Everest. But it's have you heard of it? I think it's yeah. something like, oh man, it's some kind of weird name, like nine oh two. Tonight. It's some kind of numbers, but basically what it is, it's this experience where they have all these people helping, uh, you know, like that are professional climbers and you climb a mountain in Vermont. I think it was called, oh man, oh, I can't remember the name of it, Stratton, I think is what it was. Yeah. Um, and you, they climb it over and over so many times, like, I don't know how many times it gets to be but it's quite a few, like 36 times or, yeah. you know, a lot. And so uh, a participant could get the experience of climbing Everest without climbing Everest. Gotcha. So I thought about trying it. You've motivated me. I'm like, well, I thought maybe instead of competition this year, I'll go do that thing and see what that's like. Yeah, no, I definitely encourage you to. You should. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I find that it gets me through to be thinking about not now when it hurts and it's so hard, but later on in the future. Did setting goals help pull you through when you were like rehabbing? What, what pulled you through? You know, I'm going to tie it back to the people again. The people really pulled me through. Um, but I also, you know, I think milestones are huge. I think all too often we get so fixated on the end goal that we miss the entire journey to that point. And I do. I, you know, I'm, I'm a list person. I'm super goal oriented, super task oriented. I love the feeling of marking something off of a list. So I do. I, you know, whether it's a small goal for a day or if it's a goal for a month or goal in training, I, I'm constantly doing that. Um you know, I, I think goals make people uncomfortable because the what if of, you know, maybe not getting to that point or not meeting your deadline or whatever it is, but you have to be uncomfortable to grow. If you're, if you're not uncomfortable, you're not growing, you're not evolving, you're not changing. And I think kind of the same thing that I mentioned, you know, we can get super fixated on the things that we don't reach, or we can look at how far we got along the process of, of getting to that goal. So it's all about perspective to me. Um, but I do, yeah. It goes all the time. <laughs> and I have to venture to say that you've done more on two legs. I mean, like on one leg than I've done on two. <laughs> so like, I, I got that backwards. Um, and, and I'm just like, how, like you, you went from, you know, having all the, this dramatic um, injury and just hardship. And then you became a stunt woman in movies. And <laughs> <laughs> um, how did that how did you end up doing that? You know, that was just a, a right place and the and the right time at the right time kind of thing. I was spending a lot of time in Hollywood and I had some friends that knew that I still was an adrenaline junkie more or less. And they were looking for people to, to be in, you know, to do the movie scenes of car crashes and explosions and pyro and stuff like that. And I said, absolutely, sign me up. <laughs> so I just jumped right into it. So what would you say, uh, what movie were you in and what was your like biggest stunt? So the, I guess the, the biggest one that you could go out and find was Patriot's Day with Mark Wahlberg. Um, and as you can imagine with being an amputee, I was the stunt woman in the bomb blasts. Um, so I took the blasts and in turn lost my leg <laughs> in the movie. So. Oh my gosh. Now, that, now, did that kind of, I mean, I don't know, but when, what seems like very similar, did you have some emotional moments? Oh, absolutely. Well, that's why, you know, the irony, irony in it is, is uh, pretty significant. So of course, you know, while I'm doing these stunts, I, I have to be screaming and crying and, and acting, um, and, you know, as they throw me into the back of the ambulance or whatever different, you know, part that we're doing. And those are real tears because it is, it becomes 
very, very real very quickly when you're covered in blood all over again and you have, um, you know, you know, special effects and stuff on your, on your residual limb to make it look like it was just blown off and your clothes are ripped apart and everything. So it, um, if you see me crying in the movie, those are real tears. Those are definitely not, uh, oh my gosh. Fake alligator tears. So this movie came out when, when did the movie come oh, out? 2015, 2016. Okay. I don't know if I've seen it. I'm definitely going to have to because I'm a huge Mark Wahlberg fan. I really like uh, his movie, The Shooter, and some other movies. Yeah. Um, and so did you get to meet Mark? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. yeah good dude. I, I really like him, actually. So, <laughs> so you had some pretty cool experiences along the way. What What is, uh, you've got this foundation, the Kirstie Ennis Foundation. That's that's pretty cool in itself. What is your mission for your foundation and why did you create it? Ultimately, um, I founded it just to legitimize what I was doing. You know, I've dedicated my life to raising awareness and fundraising for deserving nonprofits, the nonprofits that are out there that are truly doing what they say they're doing and helping the communities that they say they're helping. Um, and I guess as I was going through the hospital, I recognized the fact that uh, the nonprofit world is is uh, a pretty finicky place, and there's a lot of a lot of frauds out there. And so I wanted to to help the ones that were you know that are real, the ones that are actually helping. Um, and that's why I started the mountains. And ultimately, in my nonprofit, uh, we financially support other other deserving nonprofits um, by fulfilling grants. And then we also do individual scholarships and do um, provide education opportunity and, and healing in the outdoors. So we provide different things like clinics for the disabled or veteran populations or women. Um, we do different events like children's climbing events and, and rock climbing gyms and whatnot. Uh, it's just exposing to people to the opportunities that they, they may never have otherwise. How can people out there support you? Yeah, definitely. Um, just check out our website, KirstianusFoundation.org, or just follow along on social media where the Kirstianus Foundation is on Facebook and on Instagram. And what would you say to somebody out there today that finds herself in a situation that they feel like they've lost their way or they've lost, you know, some part of their selves or if they're suffering from major adversity, what would you say to them to kind of light their way and give them some inspiration? My personal mantra with dealing with everything that I did um, was it's the six inches between your ears and what's behind your rib cage that dictates what you're capable of. You control your circumstances. They don't control you. I love that. I love that so much. What are three tips that you can just leave today for everyone out there um just in general just like living their life well the first one would be reflect on what you have be appreciative of what you have always give more than you receive um, whether that's time or resources or energy it doesn't necessarily have to be money and um you know reach out I think the biggest thing that I've gotten away from and I'm totally guilty of it is, you know, I don't reach out to a lot of my marine buddies or I don't reach out from my friends from childhood. And, you know, I kick myself in the butt for that every day um, because those people, like you were meant to live your life for other people and for those friendships and relationships that you have. So cultivate them, coddle them, love them. <laughs> I love that. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Well, I have so enjoyed having you on and I just want to acknowledge you so much for serving for the country and having courage and, you know, just pushing through adversity and being a role model and a hero to us all. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. It was an honor to serve and I don't know, doing the best I can with what I got and trying to help everyone I can along the way. Well, you are amazing, and I'm amazed and inspired. Uh, where can people reach you again on social media? Yeah, track me down on uh, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. It's just my name, Kirsty Ennis. Thank you so much for coming on today. I was so honored to have you as a guest. And thanks, everybody out there, for listening. And make sure to review Kirsty's story in iTunes and give her some love. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>